plan on a quiz on Tuesday. I don't know how much it will include. But I'll tell you at the end of class. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off on page 1184 in the seventh edition. If you have, that is the seventh edition, right? Yeah, in the seventh edition. Um, if that's the one you're using, if you're not using the seventh, I have no idea what page it's on. It's Act One, Scene Three, where Laertes is talking to. Ophelia, and we talked about this um, on Tuesday, where he's advising her what about her relationship with Hamlet? Page? Eleven oh four. Is he saying Hamlet doesn't really love her? He belongs to Denmark. He doesn't say he doesn't really love you. He he kind of implies. He might love you now, but his greatness weighed, that is, the fact that he's a future king, he says he can't, line 20, carve for himself, for on his choice depends the safety and health of this whole state. Okay, So he will have to give in to whatever his council, council of advisors suggests would make a good marriage for him. That's why, by the way, Claudius, in his opening speech, you know, where he talks about, you know, the death of his brother and how they brought joy out of the sorrow by his marrying Gertrude. That's why Claudius says, and you all gave voice to this. In other words, the body of advisors is complicit in what? What is Claudius's relationship with Gertrude, actually? Louder? Okay, so it's considered what? Incestual. It's incest. Okay. So, he tells her, weigh what loss, line 29, weigh what loss your honor may sustain if with too credent ear you list his songs. With too credent, too believing ear you listen to his songs. Or lose your heart or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. He's saying, be careful, Ophelia. Why? You may lose your honor if you are too believing of Hamlet's pretty love songs. Okay? How can she lose her honor? By having sex with him. This is the problem I have with Kenneth Branagh's version. Because Branagh's version implies, take that back, it doesn't imply, it clearly shows Hamlet and Ophelia are having sex. Now, it could be, as you would think, probably would be the case in most sibling relationships, maybe she is having sex and she hasn't told her brother, because that would be kind of weird. Okay? But I don't think the text of the play supports the interpretation that they are having sex. So, she says, Okay, I'll listen. Big brother, I will take your advice. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But, good my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whiles like a puffed and reckless libertine himself the primrose path of dalliance treads. What is she saying? What is she suggesting Laertes is creating? A double standard. Don't tell me to do something you're not going to do yourself. Okay? Notice, as some ungracious pastors. I don't think it's an accident Shakespeare puts that language in there. He is saying, through Laertes, there are some pastors who preach what? How does she put it? The steep and thorny way to heaven, but don't follow it themselves. Okay? And Rex not his own reed. Rex, we don't use the word wreck very often. Not this spelling. We use the one with the W. Rick or present tense, Rex. What word do we get from 
this that we sometimes still use. Reckless. Reckless. Reckon. If you reckon something, what does that mean you're doing? You're summoning. You're not summoning. <coughs> putting it together. You're thinking it. You're thinking about it. Well, I reckon so. I mean, it's kind of old-fashioned. It's more used in the West and the South than in other parts of the country. Reckless means careless? Uh-uh. Thoughtless. Okay? So, and wrecks not his own reed. We don't use this word at all spelled this way. Okay? This comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word. That does have usage today, spelled this way, R-E-A-D, but it is not the word read, as in reading Shakespeare. There's one context in which this word is used in its old Anglo-Saxon meaning. You get arrested by the police. What is the Supreme Court in a law in a ruling issued, I don't remember, it's 1966 or so, what is the Supreme Court agreed every cop must do to you when you are arrested? Read you your rights. That doesn't mean the cop pulls out the little sheet with the Miranda statement. You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. It means advise. You have the right to be advised of your rights, not read your rights. Read in this context means advised, okay? So, and Rex not his own advice. So, he's getting ready to leave. Polonius comes in. And Polonius says, you're still here? <coughs> Come on, move, move, move. Aboard. Aboard for shame. And then he stops him. Why does he stop him? This is one of the most famous passages in all of Hamlet. Along with to be or not to be, oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt. What does Polonius do from line 58 to 80? He gives fatherly advice. These are, if you want to put it this way, Polonius's proverbs. Okay? Statements of wisdom. But almost all critics read these lines as being examples, or exemplars, if you want, of Polonius's foolishness. That this is not good advice. I disagree entirely. I think. The advice Polonius is giving here, this is actually very wise advice. Okay? And because a lot of it is, quote unquote, biblically rooted. That is, you can find parallels to many of these little sayings in the book of Proverbs. So, these few, few precepts, these few precepts, in thy memory look thou character. Character. What does he mean there? Does he mean look to your character? Have a good character? No. Character means right. Look thou right these few precepts in thy memory. Okay? The other day we had up here, you know, some of the themes. Uh, seeing, observing, watching, etc. Spying, etc. Well, Reading, writing, those are issues in the play also. Because now we're being told what by Polonius? Polonius says, Hamlet, write these down in your mind. Keep them there. Memorize them. Okay? When we see Hamlet with the ghost, the ghost is going to say some things. And Hamlet tells us what he's going to write in his memory. What proverbial wisdom he's going to write. So, let's go through these. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. 
We'll read it through it all, but then we'll come back. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them unto thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged courage. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy. Place. For the apparel oft proclaims the man. And they in France of the best rank and station are of a most select and generous chief in that. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulleth edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, that thou canst, thou canst not then be false to any man. Okay? Back up. So give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Give thy thoughts no tongue. What does that mean? Keep your thoughts what? To yourself. I often tell my kids, facetiously, who are, you know, from 17 to almost, what year is this? To almost 26. You know, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. What does he mean? What is free advice worth? <laughs> Zip. Give your thoughts no tongue. Just don't tell people what you're thinking. What else? Notice the flip side of that. Nor any unproportioned thought his act. Well, how do you give thought an act. No. Close. You do it. That is, you come up with the idea and you act upon it. You bring it out. Give no unproportioned thought his act. What's he mean by unproportioned? What is something that is unproportionate? Un there means what? Out of. So if it's out of proportion, it's it's not appropriate, it's out of whack, it's unbalanced, okay? It's not well thought out. So don't act. What's a word that implies something that's not well thought out? Rashly. Don't act rashly. Don't jump to conclusions. That is, when the jumping is an actual action. Okay? Good advice? Bad advice. What's, you know, one of the number one criticisms about the president? It's this thing. He, he doesn't know the... Give no unproportioned thought is act. It's, you know, the thought comes in and boom, it's out to 20 million people. Okay? Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. What's be thou familiar mean? Think Henry IV talking to Prince Hal in that great speech where he says, I wasn't like the sun, daily in appearance, but was what? Like a meteor or like a comet. That is rarely seen so that when I was seen, people went, oh, there's Bolingbroke or there's the king. Be familiar, that is, it's okay that people know who you are, but not vulgar. What was Hal's problem? According to Prince, according to Henry the Fourth, it's it's not just that he was with the common folk. I mean, that's part of it, Thomas. He was what? Always with the commoners. Everybody saw him all the time. Where? 
in and out of the bars and the stews, the brothels. So be familiar, but, but not vulgar, not common. Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried. Well, how do you try your friend's adoption? And what does that mean? It doesn't mean legal adoption. Test your friends. You know, you've, you've proven their friendship. They're not the proverbial fair weather friends. Because what happens to fair weather friends when it's like this? They're gone. They leave you. So, the friends that you have, and you've proven they're, they're good friends, do what? Grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. That is, you ensure those people remain your friends. How do you do that? Well, you do for them what you want them to do for you. Okay? But, but what? Do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each hatched each new hatched, unfledged courage. What does that mean? Look at your gloss. Courage. Swashbuckler. Okay. Go back to that. Do not dull thy palm with entertainment of new, each new hatched, unfledged. What does unfledged mean? An arrow is fledged when you put the feathers in it. Okay, what do what do the arrows do? What do the the feathers do for an arrow? They keep it flying straight. Okay, what is a fledgling in the ornithology world? It's a bird that's in its nest that hasn't yet learned what how to fly. <coughs> So, a bird that doesn't have all of its feathers, if it falls out of the nest, what happens? It dies. So, go back. Do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, bird imagery, unfledged swashbuckler. So, what's a new hatched, unfledged swashbuckler? or knight if you want, or knight in training, or possible friend, because that's what he's getting at. This is someone who wants to be your friend. Someone who wants to join your circle of friends, but hasn't done what yet? Hasn't been proven, hasn't been tested, okay? What's he saying? You got a small group of friends? Keep that small group of friends. Don't expand, expand, expand. You wonder what Polonius would think of Facebook. <laughs> you know, where you have friends <coughs> who, you know, live in China or somewhere, you know, that you will never meet. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. So beware of entrance to a quarrel. Why? Why not get into every fight you can? You're not going to win them all? Okay. What's he saying? If you can't avoid a quarrel, do it. But if you must fight, then what? Louder? Fight with honor? Does he talk about honor in that line? Make sure, and how? Bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. You know, the old, uh, let's go back to the invasion of, of um, Baghdad. What supposedly were all the, the newscasts talking about because the generals were telling us this was what the United States was going to do? Shock and awe. That is, if you have to get into a fight, do what? You so defeat that quote-unquote enemy that they know, don't mess with this person. Okay, No holds barred. 
literally. So, give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Now, Monty Python would literally have you pull an ear off and hand it to somebody if they did this. Too bad they, you know, they could have done such great stuff with Shakespeare. So, how do you give every man thy ear? You listen. You listen to what everyone says. That doesn't mean you're on this thing scouring the internet. You listen to them what? Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. We're going to talk about the few thy voice in just a second. Take each man's censure. Give every man thy ear, take each man's censure means listen to what everybody says to you about you. If somebody is critical of you, take it. Listen to it. Okay? Now go back up to the other half of the line about give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Well, that goes back up to give thy thoughts no tongue. Take every man's, give every man thy ear, but few thy voice means listen and don't what? Don't respond. Isn't that one of the huge problems I would argue in our country today? Nobody's listening and everybody's responding. In fact, people are responding even before something is said. Okay? Kind of the preventive rhetoric, if you want. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Now, the reserve thy judgment could be, don't respond. That is, you called me, oh yeah, well, your mother. Could mean that. I don't think so. I think it means literally, don't judge others. Reserve thy judgment. Now, that's clearly biblical, right? I mean, that, that comes from the top, so to speak. Do not judge others, lest you be judged. Okay? Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy. That is, wear clothes, what? That you can afford. Okay? Wear clothes that you can afford. But not expressed in fancy. What would you think if a classmate walked into class on Tuesday... A guy, let's say, wearing a tux, <coughs> and he wore it for class. Okay, that'd be weird. Or one of the women walked in wearing a wedding dress. What? Yeah, that'd be weird. That's too fancy. Okay, so rich, not gaudy. What's the difference between rich and gaudy? Louder. Rich has taste. Melania Trump, rich. Um, Elton John at his concerts, gaudy. No, no, no taste there. Especially Elton John 20, 30 years ago, you know, with the platform boots and the big giant glasses. Okay? That is, you can dress very tastefully or you can dress gaudily. Just completely inappropriate for the occasion. Why? For the apparel oft proclaims the man. True or false? We want to believe that's not true. We shouldn't judge people by how they look. Notice that we shouldn't. It's not we don't. Okay? We do. Every one of us, and I will cast this dispersion on all of us, every one of us is guilty of this. Whether we think we are or not, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we're walking down a street, we're driving down a road, we see somebody homeless, we see somebody covered in filth, and our immediate reaction is not pity, but disgust. And then, maybe pity. All right? That's an important facet that he's talking about. Apparel off proclaims a man. What happens if you go into a job interview and you're dressed like a quote-unquote slob? 
You're not going to get it unless the job interview is, you know, working at the local um, water purification plant and you're out there shoveling the sludge or you're cleaning out stables, then it would be appropriate. But if you're trying to get a job in a financial industry, you better be dressed how, especially if you're a guy. Suit. If you're a woman, nice dress or nice pants, you know, nice pants and blouse kind of a thing. Okay. The apparel oft proclaims the man. Why? It's the first thing we see. First impressions are real. I always tell this story. About 20 years ago, maybe even longer than that. First, I don't know, three or four years after I was teaching here, this is back in the 90s, I was walking across from KUC back towards Peck. I'd gone down there to check my mail. And it was a break between classes, and so there's this Mass of people coming from Peck Hall, probably over to Mass Com or something like that. And there's this, this other guy who leaves KUC to walk towards Peck. And this is back when the walkway that left from KUC to Peck was literally only about this wide, the width of this aisle, before they widened it a few years ago. And the guy that left KUC, I'm not kidding, I'm not exaggerating, okay, had a lot of piercings. That, if I remember right, he had like two... Um, Paper clips hanging from the eyelid here and, you know, various other piercings. And he was wearing a, is either white or pink, I can't remember which, tutu. Like a ballerina's tutu. Right? With white leggings. And he starts walking towards Peck. And there's, I'm not kidding, it's got to be 200 students coming this way. And this guy's skipping. And it's like Moses at the Red Sea. <laughs> That two hundred, it just parts. Okay? And he just goes on his merry way, and they're all like, you know. Apparel off proclaims the man. What did they all think? <laughs> Something's wrong with him. But he was, to use a phrase from another thing of Shakespeare, he marched to the tune of his own drummer. And they in France, of the best rank and station, are both. And so Shakespeare gives his little nod to France. Why? Because the Frenchies are known for their taste in clothing. So, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Why? Loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulleth edge of husbandry. If you're a borrower and you borrow money from your friend, what have you just done to your friendship? Put a strain on. In fact, what Polonius says is you, you've actually ended it. You might not have ended it right then, but it will come to an end, especially if you don't pay it back. Okay? Why else do you, should you not borrow? It dulleth edge of husbandry. What's husbandry? Diligence, industriousness, hard work. Why work? Then you could take out a loan. Why work hard when somebody will give you, quote unquote, give you the money? You know, the housing crisis 2008, 2009, the thing that caused, you know, the whole crash of the market and all that kind of stuff. Why did that occur? Because earlier, 2001, 2002, beginning 19, about 1997, 98, subprime loans. What does subprime loans mean? You have the prime lending rate, maybe it was 4%, and so you had subprime loans given at 2% or 3% to people who couldn't afford the loans at the 4%. Guess what? They couldn't afford them at the 2% or 3% either. A little word of warning, the same thing is happening again today. Subprime loans have made a huge comeback. It's one of the reasons why home ownership is on the rise again. You make it easier to borrow money even though you don't have the income to justify borrowing that money and people are going to buy houses. So, it loses, loan off loses both itself and friend and borrowing dulleth edge, edge of husbandry. This above all, that is, this final precept tops all the others. To thine own self be true, 
and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. What's it mean to be true to yourself? Thank you for bringing that up. Know thyself. Who said that? Know thyself. Where was it said? Anybody know? The Oracle of Delphi. In Delphi, Greece, had a stone out in front of it. The Oracle was a person you would go to speak to, and the Oracle would tell you the word of the God, usually Apollo. And there was this inscribed on a stone, Know thyself. The reason Socrates was thought to be the wisest man in the world, one, the Oracle said that to him. Told him, you're the wisest man in the world. He said, oh, come on. It can't be the truth. And so what did he do? If you've read Plato's dialogues, he goes around and he starts asking people all kinds of questions, which is he wants to prove somebody else is wiser, wiser than he is. And what does he keep finding out? There are people who consider themselves wise who aren't wise at all. He said, Socrates said, I don't know nothing. I'm not wise. That's why he was the wisest man in the world. Okay? To thine own self be true, and it follows like night the day, you cannot be false to any man. That is, if you follow what? Your own inner moral compass. If you do what you think, know slash believe, to be right, then what? then you can't be false to anybody else. He's talking about morality here. If you follow that inside, then that inside you will say what? I shouldn't lie <laughs> to this person. I shouldn't cheat this person. I shouldn't wrong this person. Okay? Bad advice? To give to his son who's going off to college, because that's essentially what he's doing, or going back to college. No, that's pretty good advice. Okay. Question is, does Polonius believe his son will follow it? No. How do we know? Because later on he's going to send Reynaldo to act as what <coughs> on Laertes? A spy. Here's one of the reasons this is often not taken to be good advice. Apply it to Polonius. Does Polonius give his thoughts no tongue? No, what does he always do? Says what he thinks. What's his professional job? Advisor. That means what? I speak what I think to the king. That's his problem. Polonius doesn't take his own advice, which is possibly, excuse me, which is partially why we get Laertes giving advice to Ophelia. Okay? And Ophelia says, well, I'll follow it as long as you follow your own advice. And then we have Polonius offer advice to Laertes, and Polonius doesn't do what Ophelia says. Follow your own advice. Okay? So Laertes leaves and Ophelia comes in. And Polonius wants to know, what were you and Laertes talking about? She says, oh, Hamlet. So what about Hamlet? Well, line 100. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? You speak like a green girl. She is a green girl! Not green, young, tender, untested, innocent. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. And this is one of the problems with Ophelia. Especially, you know, feminist criticism loves, loves to look at Ophelia. Because her name begins with O, that is, she's a zero. She's just kind of your classical airhead. According to a lot of feminist criticism. I don't think so. 
So I don't know what I should think. Why? Because she doesn't have that much experience with men. Or maybe I shouldn't say that much and replace that with any. He says, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby that you obtain these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Sterling, British language. For us, it'd be like, if, when we were back on the gold standard, gold. You know, when the dollar used to be tied to a certain amount of gold. What's he saying these tenders really are? Can you go into a store, buy something, and hand that store an IOU? No, you can't. That's what he is implying these things are. So what are the tenders? We find out later. Letters, poems. What things, quote, you know, do guys, I'll use myself as an example. You know, when my wife and I were dating, you know, I'd send her cards, send her letters, send her flowers, go out for dinner, all the typical kind of court, that's what Hamlet does. So, she says, my Lord, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. That is, he is a perfect gentleman. <laughs> yeah, fashion, you may call it. Why does he say that? <clears throat> she says in honorable fashion. What does she mean by fashion? Manners. Appropriately. What does he mean by fashion? Okay, what else? Like, clothes. And you can do what with them? You can hide things. What else can you do? Well, you can put on that fashion and you can take off that fashion. In other words, it's all part of what? The apparel oft proclaims the man. Well, she's not done. He hath given countenance to his speech, my Lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Notice almost. Almost only works where? Hand grenades and horseshoes. You can't be almost pregnant. Pregnant. You can't, well, I guess you can be almost dead. No, you can't. You're either dead or you're not. You can be near death. But that's not. So, springs to catch woodcocks. What are springs to catch woodcocks? Traps to catch birds. It's not an accident that Shakespeare uses this. That even in Shakespeare's day, the term bird was slang for a woman. Okay? Traps to catch women. That is, all of Hamlet's tenders... <laughs> All of his almost holy vows of heaven are designed for one purpose only. And they are what? To get laid. In fact, he's even going to use that language. Okay? So he talks about, you know, the blood burning, etc., etc. From this time be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parl. So, Remove yourself from Hamlet. Don't believe his vows. They are brokers. Like a real estate broker. Like a pawn broker. Okay? Brokers are what? A middleman. What do brokers do? They sell you something. These things, when you're talking about selling flesh, become what? These are pips. Okay. She says, okay. Act 1, scene 4. We have Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus, enter. Hamlet talks about the king, line 8 and following. Wake tonight and taking his rouse. That is, they're having a drunken party at the castle. And Horatio says, is, is this a custom? Is this normally what happens? And Hamlet gives us one of the famous, you know, passages or quotes, if you want. Hamlet, but to my mind, though I am native here, and to the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than in the observance. Yeah, that's what we Germans typically do. 
We drink to excess. Okay? That's his implication. But it's more honored in the breach in not doing it. It's better if we don't. All right? Keep going on. Um, this play. I can spend five weeks on it easily. Um, the ghost comes in. Skip the rest of that little speech by Hamlet. Angels and ministers of grace defend us. Ministers of grace, it's another phrase that just means angels. Because what are angels? They're messengers. Angelus means messenger. It doesn't mean disembodied winged spirit. Because if you're disembodied, how do you have wings, first of all? Okay. Angelus just means messenger. So messengers and messengers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned, that is whether you are a spirit from God or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven or blast from hell, be thy intents wicked or charitable. <clears throat> thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I don't care who you are. I don't care who has sent you. I will speak to you. Why? Because you look like Dan. I'll call thee Hamlet, king, father. Answer me. Tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have burst their cerements. Canonized. Canonized means sainted, but not sainted as in he is a religious saint, but he has received holy burial. Okay? And once you receive holy burial, or frankly even for that matter, unholy burial, Let's assume this is a tomb. It's like a tomb in New Orleans, which they don't go underground. They build them up on top of the ground. What is the thing inside this tomb supposed to do? Forever. Stay there. Why isn't it? Or at least the spirit of it. In, in I'm an Orthodox Christian, like Russian, Greek, etc. In, in, one tradition in the Orthodox Church, when there's a funeral and the person is buried, before the, the coffin gets lowered to the ground, a priest will come up with a cross and will say, this grave is sealed until the day of judgment, and smacks the, the coffin with the cross. And he says that three times. Why? Because in some areas of Europe, there is still this belief that what can happen can come out. Which is why over the last 10, 15 years, there have been, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen or so archaeological discoveries dating from, just read one the other day, 2nd century AD up to 15th, 16th century, of people buried with wooden stakes through their hearts. Vampires. It's not, Bram Stoker did not create that myth. That, that is an old idea. Okay? One, um, one of the ones most recently, a child buried with a stone in its mouth. This was another anti-vampire kind of thing. Second century, Roman. Really, really old. So, why have you burst your cerement? That is your tomb. Why the sepulcher wherein we saw thee quietly inured hath oped his ponderous marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean that thou dead corpse Again, incomplete steel. In other words, it looks like Hamlet is, is suggesting, it looks if I were to walk over to you and did this, I wouldn't go through you. I, I would actually touch the body. Revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, etc., etc. So, what are you here for? And the ghost does this. Horatio wants you to go. Marcellus. Come on, he wants you to, Hamlet, I'll go. Horatio, no, you won't. I will. I do not set my life at a pin's fee. A pin's fee. The fee? Cost. I'm not worth the cost of a pin. Well, how do we know that? How do we know that Hamlet already thinks that? Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt. Or that the 
Almighty had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. If God hadn't said, don't kill yourself, I'd be gone. And for my soul, what can it do to that? What can a ghost do to a soul, being a thing immortal as itself? Right? Christ says in one of the Gospels, actually in the three synoptic Gospels, don't worry about the thing that can kill the body. Worry about the thing that can kill the soul. Ghosts can't do that. They can kill the body. So, Horatio. Yeah, but if it leads you away, it might do what? Assume some other horrible form. It might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness. It might make you go mad. It might go all, you know, Mike Myers or, you know, pick your horror slasher film on you and make you lose your reason. Ah. There's a theme. Which is tied into the play acting theme, or it will be shortly. Reason, madness, tied into play acting. Hamlet, I'm going to follow it. No. My fate cries out, line 81, and makes each petty artery in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. Unhand me, gentlemen. Why? They're holding on to him. They're holding him back. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me, lets me, prevents me, stops me. Let me go, or I'm going to kill you. Horatio. He waxes desperate with imagination. Waxes, grows. Desperate. What is someone who is desperate? Irrational. Irrational? What happens when you become desperate? What does desperate mean? It's day... Despair comes from space, hope, S-P-E-S. -E it's without hope. He becomes without hope with what? Imagination. Go back to everything Theseus said about the imagination in Midsummer Night's Dream. So, Horatio, to what issue will this come, Marcellus? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Why is something rotten in the state of Denmark? Earlier when the three were talking, what did Horatio tell Marcellus and Bernardo about in the past when ghosts were seen? Okay, what else? He mentioned a historical character. Somebody Shakespeare wrote a play about. Whose death had been foreboded, not forbidden, Foretold, foretold Julius Caesar, okay, by ghosts and such. So Marcellus is saying, things are coming to a head. This isn't good. Horatio, heaven will direct it. Remember I said Horatio is probably some kind of Christian stoic? That is, you don't go high, you don't go low, you know, everything's in God's hand. God's hand. Kind of the Boethius idea. Everything is under God's control, even though from down here, it looks horrible. It just looks awful. Heaven will direct it. God will take care, will manage whatever's happening to Denmark. So the ghost in Hamlet enter, well, uh, Act 1, Scene 5. Hamlet says, Whither wilt thou lead me? Now, he might just mean... Are we going over there or are we going over there? But he also might mean, are we going over there or are we going over there? Where are you taking me? Stop. I'm not going anymore. And the ghost says, my hour is almost come when I to sulfurous and tormenting flames must render up myself. So sulfurous and tormenting flames... Does it sound like Ted Danson and Kristen Bell's The Good Place? Sounds like The Other Place. P. 
pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Hamlet, speak. I'm bound to hear, so art thou to revenge. This is, after all, as your introduction talked about, a revenge tragedy. Okay? Popularized in ancient Rome by Seneca, who wrote a lot of them. Popularized in Shakespeare's day, first by um, Thomas Kidd, Spanish tragedy. Okay? Uh, Tamerlane by Marlowe. I might have those two backwards. I don't think so. Okay? So what happens in a revenge tragedy? You usually have the ghost of someone who has recently been murdered comes to a surviving family member and says, avenge my death. And the play is all about that death being avenged. Usually, in Seneca's plays, you know, that, that avenging happens relatively soon, but then there's a whole lot of avenging going on. And you end up with a pile of bodies. Okay? Shakespeare alters the revenge tragedy kind of formula by having the revenge drawn out. And there's a lot of questions as to why. Well, one obvious reason is he writes five act plays and not three act plays or, or one act plays. But it's also because he wants to expand, let's say, on Hamlet's characterization and on some of the other characters' um, characterization. So, you're bound to revenge. I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to walk the night, and for the day confined to fast and fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. So where is he? Hell? No. Heaven? Purgatory. Who believes in purgatory? Catholics. Protestants sure as hell don't. Okay, and this is written sometime 1599-1602. Okay. Are Catholics in power in 1599-1602? No. No. Not even near. In fact, Catholics are being hunted down and persecuted. If you are a Catholic priest in England, that's a capital crime. That is, just to be a capital priest living in England is cause for your execution. Even if you're not doing anything, even if you're not celebrating Mass, hearing confession, nope, just to be a Catholic. Why? 1588, Spanish Armada. Damn Catholics tried to invade, wanted to overthrow Elizabeth partly to bring Catholicism back. Shakespeare's family, historically, was Catholic. Okay? There's reason to believe, you know, including up to Shakespeare's, at the very least, early years in life. Some would argue, possibly even when he's writing this play, he was a closet Catholic. Okay? I mean, after all, he has to go say, I'm in purgatory. That kind of suggests what? A uh, belief in purgatory. A strict Calvinist would not write that. Okay? Because Calvin said, there is no purgatory. There's heaven, there's hell. According to Calvin, vast majority, I used to be strict Presbyterian. According to Calvin, the vast majority of people go to hell. Vast majority. Relatively few make it to heaven. Okay. Definitely makes for a better story because, I mean, you can't have the ghost otherwise. Okay. So, notice, during the day, what happens to him? His sins are burnt and purged away. But I can't tell you about my prison house. But if I could, oh, buddy... I would literally scare the hell out of you. That is, I would scare you into heaven. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, all that kind of stuff. Okay? I would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, blah, blah, blah. But if thou didst ever thy father love, Hamlet, oh God. 
Revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul is in the best it is, but this most foul. That is, murder most foul is in the best it is. The very best of murders is always foul. It's always wrong. It's always evil. But this most foul, strange, and unnatural. Why? My brother. Which means it's also what? <coughs> it harkens back to the very first murder. Hamlet. Haste me to know it with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my room. Tell me who and I'll go kill him right now. That's what he means. Ghost, I find thee apt. That is, okay, you're ready. You know, it's almost like the ghost thought I was going to have to do some convincing. So, he says, No, 39, thou noble youth, the serpent that did my thy father's life, that, the, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul. What does Hamlet mean by saying that his soul was prophetic? Yes. Yeah. I knew it! I knew that dirty, rotten SOB Claudius killed you. I, that insistuous, that adulterate beast. Well, what is Hamlet already called Claudius in the, oh, that this tutu sullied flesh would melt speech? A satyr. A beast. Okay. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there for me, whose love, etc., etc. So he gives us the big, long speech, and what does he tell us happened in that big, long speech? What did Claudius do? He says, you know, I was just taking a nap out in my garden, and my dirty, rotten, backstabbing brother came up and poured poison in my ear and gave out that I was stung by an adder. Line 77. Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. Unhouseled, disappointed, unannaled, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. This is an example of what I mean when I say this is the most religious of Shakespeare's plays. What's he getting at here? He died how? Unforgiven. Or... To use the term they would have used, unshriven. To shrive, okay, someone is when a priest absolves that person of his or her sin. It's part of the process of confession, absolution, penance. It's a threefold or a three part process that all falls under the general rubric of confession, okay? Confession, you go and you confess your sins to the priest. The priest then absolves you, not because of some power in him, but because, you know, being the representative of God, and then gives you penance. You have to do something. It might be, say, so many Hail Marys if you're Catholic. It might be help the poor if you've been stealing or something, okay? So he says, I died how? Unshriven. I died with all my sins on my head. That's why he's in purgatory. Remember me, he says at the end of his speech and leaves. Okay? So, now let's back up. Can't, go, can't jump down there. So he says, Line 83, let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned it incest. Why is incest damned? Okay, Because it's damned in the Bible. It's, it's illegal. It's against the law. It's against the Mosaic law. Okay, It also leads to, you know, muddying up the gene pool, so to speak. So, he says... But however you pursue this act, what? Taint not thy mind. Okay, now taint means what? This board is tainted. This one's clean. 
Now it's tainted. Taint means take something that is pure, like paint, and drop any other color in it at all. Single drop. That taints it. Notice, you know, it's not right. How clean is this board other than this one spot? It's pretty clean, right? It's like, I don't know. 99.99999 whatever percent. Okay. So taint not thy mind implies what? Don't even just don't go all crazy about this, Hamlet. And so taint not thy mind. Oh, and don't don't do anything to your mother. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge to prick and sting her. So Taint not your mind. Let your mind remain mostly pure. Okay? And leave your mother alone. Ghost leaves. What does Hamlet do? Oh, all you host of heaven. So, all the heavenly beings, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, all the angelic realms, O oh, earth, that is, earth and everything on it, Let's see, what else? What else? What else can I couple? Oh, yeah, hell. So, kind of the medieval threefold heavens up there. Here's earth. Hell's down below. Whether it's like Dante's down in earth or some metaphysical below. Couple that is join them all together. Oh, if I hold, hold my heart. Well, what did he say earlier about his soul? Down, boy. Now, hold my heart. Hold how? What's he saying his heart wants to do? Explode. He's trying to duct tape it together. And you, my sinews, grow not instant old and bear it, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? I, thou poor ghost, whilst, whilst memories holds a seat, where? In this distracted globe. What's the distracted globe? Where does your memory have a seat? What's he saying about his mind? He calls it distracted. What are you if you're distracted? You're sitting in a class, your phone goes off. Or a phone goes off. Your eyes go there. Fire alarm goes off. You're distracted. Anything other than listen to whoever is teaching. You're, what does that mean? Yeah, because the tract is related to the word for tractor. Tractor is related to the word for drag. That is, it pulls. So if you're distracted, you're dis away from pull. You're pulled away from the thing. His mind is what? Hamlet is telling us something here about his mind. He's not well. He's distracted. He can't focus. He's in a jumble. He is, to use a word that we talked about earlier, desperate. Remember thee? Yea. From the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records from the table of my memory that is my mind I'll do what I'll erase all trivial foolish unimportant uh, excuse me unimportant fond foolish silly records what records is he going to erase from his quote unquote hard drive well all saws of books Saws means proverbs, sayings. All forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there. So what are all forms, all pressures past, past that youth and observation? Everything that I remember from the day I was born to now. All of that. Cue the uh, men in black and their... Everything gone. And what will we put instead?
remember thee. Why remember thee? Because that's shorthand for what? Kill Claudius. He was told, don't taint your mind. If this is Hamlet's mind, what has he just done to the poor? Okay. Well, let's say this is Hamlet's mind, and this is everything he's learned up to this point in his life. So he does this, he removes everything, so it's now nice and clear. It is Jean-Jacques Rousseau's tabula rasa. And what does he put on it? Has he tainted his mind? Keep in mind what taint means. It's a little bit of color. No, he's not tainted it. What has he done? He's replaced it. He's had a hard drive replacement. He's taken everything he's learned throughout his life and replaced it with one thing. Kill Claudius. So he's disobeyed. <laughs> The others come in, and Hamlet says to them, one request, 148 or so. What is it? Don't tell anybody what you saw tonight. That is, don't let anybody know that you saw the ghost. And they swear, and the ghost, you know, in tone, swear, and they swear, etc. Okay? Horatio says, man, this was a weird night. 174, and as a stranger give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. What, what does he mean? I shouldn't spend time on this, but I will. And I told myself we would get through Act 2 today. Um, what does he mean, as a stranger, give it welcome? Let me rephrase that sentence. Give welcome to strangers. That's what he means. Horatio said, O oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. And as a stranger, give it welcome. That is, welcome everything you have seen and heard this day and night. Okay? Shakespeare's playing on, he's not aware of it. Shakespeare's playing on an old, very, very, very old custom. And it's the custom of hospitality. It's Indo-European. It goes back 3,500 to 5,000 B.C., which is essentially, you're locked up in your little hut, your cave, your whatever, your house. There's a knock on the door at night, and it's a stranger seeking refuge from the foul weather. Apparently, the Indo-European peoples, we'll talk about this if you take my history and English language course in the spring, believed it was incumbent upon you. The gods required you to give that person room and board essentially for the night. And maybe that person wasn't a stranger. Maybe that person was your blood enemy. You're required to give that person room and board for the night. Why do we think this is Indo-European? Because it shows up in all the cultures that come from the Indo-Europeans. It's in Russian, it's in Indian, it's in Greek, Italian, um, Celtic, Germanic, all of them have this. So, where do we see that same idea, however, in the Bible? I think it's Peter. It's either Peter or Paul. It says, open your door to strangers. Why? For thus have some entertained angels unaware. That is, they weren't real people. <laughs> they were angels, kind of showing up. Go back to the Old Testament. Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. Who comes and shows up on Lot's doorstep? A couple of guys. <laughs> Just a couple of guys, but yeah, they're 
angels, because what happens when they leave? <laughs> you know, Armageddon, so to speak. So, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. That is, your philosophy, Horatio, doesn't allow for some of these things. So, from here on out, Hamlet says, here, as before, never so help you mercy, how strange or odd some air I bear myself. If I act a little different from here on out, as I perchance hereafter shall think me, to put an antic disposition on. To put an antic disposition on means what? A facade? What kind of facade? What's, it, what's antic mean? We don't use that word. We use it generally with this in front of it. If you are frantic. No, not confident. What are you if you're frantic? What does this mean? I mean, it's exactly right. All over the place. Frenzied. Frenzied. Crazy. Mad. Not angry, mad, lunatic. So, if I put on an antic disposition, don't act like you know what I'm doing. Don't go, I'm not looking at him, he's pretending to be crazy. Okay? They agree, they swear. So Hamlet finishes Act 1 with, and still your fingers on your lips, I pray, that is, mum's the word, the time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. Okay, the time is out of joint. Means what? What does joint there mean? Well, think of your elbow. Hold stuff together. What does your elbow serve as? It's a joint, right? What does it connect? Because joint means a connection point. Forearm with upper arm. The shoulder's a joint. Arm to upper, upper body, etc. Okay? So time is out of joint. Think of the great chain of being. Time applies there also. Because you have 1 o'clock, which leads to 2 o'clock, which leads to 3 o'clock. It's broken. And Hamlet says what? I was born to set it right. Ah, think about that, though. When was Hamlet born? However many years ago. Was time out of joint then? No. So what's he saying? If I was born to drag this back over here, and I was born X, X years ago, and what's he saying about his birth X years ago in relation to time now? His birth had what? Louder? Possibly. I mean, if you want to get into the... Bingo. It had purpose. Okay? That is, there is a purpose for Hamlet's existence. Told you, this is a religious poem, a play. So what does that mean? What's a word that we use to describe, you know, there is a purpose to everything in the world? Providence, thank you, destiny. You can go all Greek and call it fate. Or, we can go total Calvin. John Calvin. I need to talk about Calvin. Time? Yeah, we got time. <laughs> Predestination. Okay, so who was John Calvin? He was a reformer. Thank you. Frenchman. Who later lived in Geneva. 1536. Calvin published the Institutes of the Christian Religion. 
this essentially means, you know, this isn't like the universe universities are. It means kind of like the laws, the rules of the Christian religion. And I'm going to extremely grossly simplify them. Okay? This is an extreme gross simplification that almost everybody uses. That you can summarize Calvin's basic theology in five main points. And you can use the mnemonic device TULIP to remember those. T, total depravity. That is, the total depravity of humanity. Everybody is totally depraved. Now, that doesn't mean that Calvin thought every one of us was a, um, I don't know, pick your serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, etc. Not totally depraved like that, but that every aspect of our lives, everything we do is this tainted with sin everything you sign up to serve meals at a homeless kitchen on Thanksgiving well there is a little selfish part of you a little narcissistic egoist part of you that says I'm doing this why because it makes me feel better it alleviates my white liberal guilt or you know something like that okay no matter what that is that you do it's touched by this, okay? So nobody can do something 100% good. You. Unconditional election. Let me write these all down. Let's cut off again. Limited atonement. Irresistible grace. And I used to believe this stuff, hook, line, and sinker. Perseverance of the saints. Went to a small liberal arts Presbyterian school down outside Chattanooga. Nicknamed TR, totally reformed. I mean, I card-carrying member. Not anymore. Unconditional election. What does that mean? God chooses who is saved. Period. That's it. It's unconditional because those who are the quote-unquote elect don't do anything to deserve or merit it. You can't earn God's grace, in other words. All right? So it would be like, let's say I'm God for a moment, and this is what rules. I would go, saved, 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 back there in the hat, saved, and the rest you go to hell. Why? Because that's what I chose. Period. That's it. L, limited atonement. What does that mean? Okay, atonement, or if you want to play the verbal game, at one meant, which is what some people do. That means when Jesus died on the cross, he died only for you, you, who was it else was it? You and you. The rest of you are screwed. Because all that blood had nothing to do with you. It only was for the elect. Okay? That's why the atonement is limited. And we can go through and talk about how there are problems with this, which if you want to, we will, we will another time. Irresistible grace. Those that the atonement occurs for the elect, that the atonement occurs, occurs for, are given grace by God, and it is irresistible. You can't turn it down. Okay? So I shower grace on Rebecca, and she's like, hell no! And too bad. Why? Because by the end of her life, she will show perseverance of the saints. The saints are the elect. Okay? How do you know they persevere? Because when they're on their dying deathbed, they don't go, if you, Jesus, and oh, die. Okay? So perseverance of the saints means they persevere. They stick through. They last. You know, that, that is ultimately, by the way, 
the theme of the book of Revelation. It's all about what? Overcoming. Overcoming what? The crap down here. It's not about the guy with the horns and, you know, the seven. That's all just imagery for overcoming the problems of this world. So this is what Calvin essentially taught. Um, so when he says, I was born out of time, or I was born to set time and right, part of what Calvin's doing here, okay, unconditional election, that's this, predestination. You were predestined if you're a strict Calvinist and you believe you're one of the elect, which usually go along. You believe you were predestined for that position. That no matter what you do in your life, God chose you. Now, it's, it's a real pain to be a Calvinist and to wonder about your salvation. Because that's kind of like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doubting my salvation. Yeah, but if you're elect, everything's cool. Well, how do you know if you're elect? Yeah, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> well, you persevere. <laughs> Notice it's circular logic, okay? So predestination says God, before everything was created, chose those four that I chose in the class, and the rest of you, you know, no. Why? Because St. Paul talks about predestination. He says before the foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. But Paul also says the atonement was for all. All. He doesn't even say all Christians. He says all. As in one man, all died, so in one, all were made alive, Paul says. Okay? So Hamlet is, you know, maybe this is Shakespeare going, okay, I got some Catholic doctrine in, I got to be fair, you know, got to, you know, be equal time kind of a thing. So here's some good Calvinist stuff. I was born, when? However many years before, because however many years later, time would be out of joint, and it's my duty to fix that, okay? 2-1. So 2-1, we see Polonius talking with Reynaldo. And he tells Ronaldo to do what? Go spy on my son. Cool. Ophelia comes in. We'll get through 2-1 at least. Ophelia comes in. And notice Polonius says, How now, Ophelia? What's the matter? I think the what's the matter is partially a stage direction. That is, Shakespeare is telling us something about Ophelia's character when she enters the stage. How does she appear? Unkempt. Unkempt. Frantic. A little, a little frazzled. My Lord, my Lord, I've been so. What happened in the name of God? Well, I was sewing in my closet that is in her room. She doesn't have a little closet that she goes in and sews in. And what happened? Hamlet comes in, and how does Hamlet appear? His doublet all embraced. That is, his doublet is an outer coat. And it's not buttoned. So it comes in with this outer, not like a sports jacket. Okay? It's a very tight fitting, almost like a, a waistcoat or, or a vest. And it's all unbuttoned. What else? No hat. His stockings fouled. That is, they should be tied up here and they're down around his ankles. So you can see his skin. Unguarded, down jiving to his ankle. Pale as his shirt. His knees knocking each other, and what looks so piteous and purport as if he had been loosened out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. Well, what did Hamlet just finish telling us? He's going to act a little crazy. But how crazy is he acting here? And what I mean by that is, what's the cause of this craziness? Because this has nothing to do with the ghost. What she has just described for us are symptoms of lovesickness. Because in the, in the Renaissance, when a man went in the presence of a woman, he was dressed to the nines. He was dressed perfectly. A gentleman, a courtier, had a hat on his head. His doublet would be well tied. I mean, he would be dressed per... And Hamlet? Not. Why not? 
because his mind is distracted by thoughts of love. Well, so why is he distracted? What was Polonius's last advice to Ophelia? Don't talk to Hamlet. Don't give him admittance to your presence. Mad for thy love? I don't know. Well, what did he say? He took me by the wrist, held me at heart, held me hard. Then he goes to the length of all his arm. So takes her by the wrist and does this. Okay, I mean, it's very dramatic. Hamlet falls to such perusal of my face, and he holds her by the wrist, extended arm, looks at her in the face, shaking, thrice his head, just waving up and down, sighs. Polonius, <laughs> the very ecstasy of love. What's ecstasy? No, it's not a date rape drug. Bliss. Sorry? Bliss. It's like a state, maybe? No, it's not bliss. It could lead to bliss. It's not euphoria. It is an out-of-body experience. Literally, it's when the soul leaves the body while you are still alive. Okay? Pythagoras talked about it as the transmigration of souls. But in the Pythagorean sense, it was when you die and your soul leaves your body and it goes into another body, which is why he was a vegetarian. Because I mean, you don't want to eat a cow, because that cow might be your dear old aunt, you know, Ida, who died a couple years ago. Okay? So, he says, this is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property foredoes itself. She said, he then says, have you given him hard words of late? She goes, no, I did what you told me to do. That's it. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with 2-2. Two, two. So, let's think of a quiz over... Um,